Thank you so much. Thank you, John. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so basically, um, what we're going to talk about today is um, the kind of separation between biomed and um, imaging, and also some safety considerations and hazards that may encounter as a biomed that you wouldn't necessarily be aware of that could, um, you know, we can jump a little hazardous than um, what it has to be. So, um, get going. Okay, so first topic we'll talk about is on uh, nuclear medicine. And uh, I'll be honest, as an energy guy, nuclear medicine is kind of a mystery to me, too. It's not a modality I have a lot of experience with. Though I've had a lot of experiences with nuclear medicine, not in some of the best ones. But um, so, like you say, it's kind of weird that um, the imaging people and biology people typically don't really get like work together very often, um, at least in my experience. Um, I was a, a biologist for 20 years and I've been doing um, imaging for about 13 now. So, um, hopefully, it kind of Maybe bridge the gap, but um, when I first started out as a biomed, um, you know, the imaging people were busy doing their thing, and you know, of course, I started to learn my job, so um, it's really not like crossover there. So, some of my, um, how should I say, knowledge became, um, I became aware of things that may be um, potentially hazardous just through my own stumbling and, um, you know, working by a school of hard knocks. So uh, one of the areas was nuclear medicine. So basically, uh, if you look at nuclear medicine, I mean, for myself, starting out on me and early now, think of the word nuclear and it doesn't go well in my mind. I mean, I want to stay as far away from that. So um, I have all kinds of misconceptions as to what happens in nuclear medicine. Some of them were founded, some of them were uh, way off. Um, so we'll try to kind of clear um, some of the mystery up there. So basically, the, the primary device that they use in nuclear medicine is called a gamma camera. A uh, gamma camera is basically um, a great big looking machine. It's made out of scary. It looks like something out of some kind of sci fi film. And the, those big boxy things are going to be like emitting all kinds of like nuclear, you know, proton beams or some, something like that. To be farther from the truth, um, actually, um, they're passive, they're, they're cameras. So, what will happen is um, the um, patient will come in, they'll be administered a dose of some kind of radioactive isotope. And um, all that machine does is just take pictures of them um, through uh, the gamma radiation. So really, when you walk in and see that, they're, that's as benign as anything you could possibly work around. We'll cover some of the other hazards so that we both encounter in one of these type of rooms. So basically what happens is the patients administered a dose of radioactive isotope. Uh, they, they lay down, they align the camera um, up to um, whatever particular part of the body that they wanted to um, examine. And then the camera radiation um, then is emitted from the patient and then hits the uh, front of the, the camera. So on the front here, you'll see um, these, all these little holes in this columnar. So what this does is this blocks the majority of the gamma radiation that's coming out of the patient. So only like one percent is actually making through to the camera itself, um, kind of like X-ray. Because X-ray, when about one percent of the energy put into the X-ray tube, actually comes out as usable X-rays. Um, the next um, next portion of the uh, camera is called the scintillator, and this is basically a ionizing crystal. So what will happen is, is the um, gamma radiation passes through the collimator through the little holes. It will hit that um, green area and will cause it to emit light um, beams. 
because it's reacting to the uh, crystal. So those light beams um, are in relation to where the radiation is in the body. So it's kind of like a reverse version of an X-ray. An X-ray is penetrating the body and making an image. In this case, the radiation is coming out of the body and making an image. Next um, item behind the um, crystal are these little hexagonal uh, photomultiplier tubes. And you can kind of think of them as like almost like a, a photo um, diode in that they, they make an image whenever they get lit up. So as the light is being emitted from a crystal, it's going through to these photomultiplier tubes and these all have like a reference. So then the computer then is able to take the, the image and put it together based on the position of the um, photomultiplier tube and the intensity of the signal that it's received. Another type of um, camera that they use in nuclear medicine is called a SPECT. And that stands for Single Photon Emission Computed Tomocography talk today. So again, it's, it's basically just a camera. You've got, um, you've got a head here and you've got a head here. The difference between this and some of the other ones is that it actually rotates um, back and forth so that they're able to do um, both a lateral and a, like AP view of the patient. Um, most of the times that they use this device, they're doing like a cardiac study. So, um, they'll go and they'll um, give um, the patient their isotopes, get them on the treadmill, do a stress test, and then they'll come in and they'll um, take pictures of particularly the heart to see um, if there's any kind of blockages within the coronary arteries. Now, the next step up from um, a SPEC system is a SPEC CT. So this gives them a little more advantage over just the traditional spec system. Um, with the, um, as you can see here, um, the cameras are the same, so they'll move back and forth like the other one does. But then after you do the um, exam with the uh, nuclear part of it, they'll then push them into the CT scanner, and the CT will do an anatomical scan. And then they're able to take the, the nuclear scan and this is where the isotopes are being monitored. And then they can overlay it over the CT scan and then now give them a clearer picture of exactly where um, if there's a blockage in the coronary arteries um, versus just, I don't know, it's hard to describe a nuclear medicine image, but it's very, um, say, kind of, yeah, exactly, I'm clear. And um, so with the uh, aid of the uh, CT, then that gives them a much clearer image as to where that blockage might be or what's going on with the heart. So the next type of scanner that you'll see um, being used in nuclear medicine is um, quite popular is PET scanner. It stands for Positron Emission Tomography. So um, a PET scanner is a, just basically another version of, you know, it's a fancier camera. Um, they, you know, give the patient an isotopes and then put them in the scanner and then um, use the scanner to um, map whatever location, say like they're doing, looking for a blockage of the common bile duct. They'll give the patient the uh, isotopes and then they'll focus on that area and depending on where the radiation kind of gets hung up in my tone, that there's a gallstone blocking the, the bile duct that they need to take out. Another thing with, with PET is um, the isotopes are very, have a very short half life. So they have to basically have the isotopes like right there on the side, as opposed to some of the other ones, they have a lot longer time that they can use them. Here's another uh, type of PET uh, scanner. And uh, again, the, the cameras are up, up and above, above and below. So the next um, 
advancements that they did with the PET scanners is called PET CT. Basically, they went to spec CT, and so it's got a PET scanner on the front. So, in uh, this picture, it's kind of harder to see. Um, this portion here is the PET scanner portion of the um, camera. And then back here, you'll see like a little line in the back, and that's the actual CT scanner in the back. If you see this white part here, well, we'll talk about kind of as a hazard. This is where they administer the uh, radioactive isotopes. So this is actually the portion of the room um, that you need to be careful around because if they have isotopes sitting up here, or even like an IV bag, um, it's going to be radioactive. It's part of um, what I might be doing in nuclear medicine. It's um, working on or doing a PM on what they call an arm trigger. Basically, an arm trigger is just a simple three lead cardiac monitor that um, triggers the camera when the um, heart wave is at the uh, arm portion. So, whenever the heart wave hits on this, there's a connection in the back of the monitor. It tells the camera to trigger, so that way then it hits the systolic portion of the heart and it's um, why it's beating, so that they can get a good clear picture as the heart is then doing systolic um, push. Then they can see all the anatomy when they want to see it. Otherwise, they just be taking random shots of the heart when it would be. So. My first experience dealing with um, nuclear medicine was dealing with an arm trigger. So um, my manager gave me a work order saying that they were having issues with the arm trigger. And it was down to nuclear medicine, which I'll be honest, you know, it was early in my career, so I had no idea what an arm trigger was. And I really didn't want to go to work in a place called nuclear medicine. So I go down, luckily and thankfully, he was a smart manager and he had to be a um, patient simulator. So at least that had an idea that he was working with something that was going to involve a patient monitor. So I go into the uh, control room and I talk to the gal and I say, uh, Hi, I'm here to fix your R trigger. And she points through the window and says, Yeah, it's right there by the couch. Well, not to try to appear a little like that was dumb. I just said, Well, okay, thank you. And walked into the room. Well, I didn't see anything that looked like a couch in there. So I'm kind of stumbling around looking for this imaginary arm trigger and also looking for this couch. So as I'm kind of fumbling around in the room, I hear this deep, booming voice come over and say, back out, you young man. This uh, rather large, older gentleman was standing there in the room looking at me with great disapproval that I'd be in there messing with this room. So I told him that I was looking for the arm trigger, and he said, well, it's over there by the couch. Again, don't know what the first thing I mean, I wasn't seeing anything in there that looked like a couch or cardiac monitor. Well, fortunately, I saw leads hanging off the side of the thing, so that was my first clue as to what I needed to do. Luckily, it was real easy, changed out the patient leads, and they were back to business. Next thing we'll cover is a xenon trap. So basically, um, the isotopes can be administered in three different ways. You can either um, ingest them, um, inject them, or inhale them. So this device allows the um, clinicians to give, administer the um, isotopes um, through inhaling them. And then the patient's hooked up to kind of looks like a ventilator circuit. And as they exhale during the case, um, the um, box there collects the uh, isotopes because you, know, you don't want to fill your room full of um, exhaled isotopes. So it's kind of a, a trap to keep the isotopes from spreading and, and making an even bigger mess. So one area, another area that you might be concerned on, though, I doubt you would have to do anything there in biomed, but just be aware of it. It's called either the hot room or the hot lab. So what I think what they do is they'll receive their radioactive isotopes from the outside, the company that they make it for them, 
And then what they'll do is they'll come and take those isotopes and before they um, mix them up for the patient, um, however they administer them, what they do is they have what they, they call a dose calibrator. What the dose calibrator allows them to do is to check to make sure that the isotopes are either strong enough or they're not too strong. So you want to, don't want to overdose the patient with isotopes. So this basically is just kind of a, a little, I don't know what to call it, mixing area where we handle the radiation and the isotopes before they administer them to the patient. And so the device that they use uh, to do that is called the dose calibrator. And uh, it's just like one example of it. They normally have it in the hot lab. Chances are you're not going to just be able to walk into the hot lab or the hot room. Um, they're normally locked down. They have big radiation symbols all over it. So chances are you're probably not going to want to even go anywhere near that room. And um, so anytime I ever have to go in there, I'm always escorted and asked a lot of questions as to why the nerve went on doing. Here's kind of a it's kind of hard to see, but it um, use like an ionizing chamber and um, it then measures the radiation and then the, the technician is then able to um, calibrate um, accordingly to whatever dose that they want to give. So as we we're talking, the, the patients administer radio, uh, radioactive isotopes. A lot of times you'll see them, um, you'll see some guy, unfortunately, most ones I see are so poor old retired guy. And he's got this like little lunchbox size thing on a, like a little rolling cart. And that guy is really struggling to get it down the hallway. And so basically with these little isotope containers live inside what they call a pit. And the pit's a lead line that, like I said, it looks to me like almost like a big lunchbox um, little deal. And they um, take the uh, spent ones out and um, bring the, the fresh ones in. As part of um, working around um, nuclear medicine, that is going to be another source of uh, potential hazard for you. That's a radioactive injectable isotope. So even though it looks like they just have some drugs sitting out on the table or some innocuous looking, you know, like containers, they're they are radioactive, then you will get an exposure from them. And unlike an X-ray machine, they don't turn off, they stay on until your hat is expired and goes away. So one other story, getting back to the um, arm trigger and the um, talking about things being hot. So um, I got PM for the R trigger and uh, thinking, well, okay, I don't know what it is, I know where it lives, but the whole works. So I go down to the uh, nuclear medicine department, get go into the control room and talk to the same gal and say, oh, hey, I'm the biomed, I'm here to do your R trigger on PM. And she said, yeah, it's right there by the couch, but the room is hot. And okay, so I'm walking out in the hallway going towards the room, and I'm going, why didn't you tell me the room is hot? I don't care, I don't want the facilities, you know, that's kind of one of their calls. So as I'm walking into the room, my dark, or my big, tall, elderly gentleman that ran the department was in there, and they said, uh, I am here with five minutes here to look at your trigger. And he was administering um, a dose to the patient. And he turned around and said, Yes, yeah, you come back later when the room is hot. Okay. All right. I understand that we need to come back later for no problem. But it's, um, as I'm walking down the hallway, I'm going, Why do these people keep telling me that the room is hot? I don't care. I don't, you know, the temperature is not going to bother me. Why do? Um, my PM, and then it dawned on me what the word hot meant, and then the room was radioactive. So, um, just kind of my wondering and ignorance, I figured that one out. So, if you do hear the term um, hot around men, that means the room has got a lot of radioactive isotopes in it. You probably want to come back later. Um, 
then they also, I also discovered what the couch was, and the couch um, refers to this little guy right here. I would have called it a table or a bed or something, but that refers to couch. So they mentioned it's over by the couch, and that's what you're looking for. So um, we'll move on. Okay, next thing we'll cover is uh, MRI. And um, I think probably one of the words in the hospital or what's her nice info gets your yearly dose of like learning modules that you cover all your different safety and HIPAA and all that. And you probably get some kind of a MRI type presentation to, to go over. Um, I'll kind of try and take that beyond um, what your typical um, yearly education is on those. Um, one of the things that the Joint Commission has been really focused on is um, safety zones. So if you're walking down by MRI, you might see um, zone two, or you might see zone one, and have a little, little magnet symbol there. And there's a reason for what those signs represent. So we'll use a, a hypothetical MR clinic so right here on this part, I'll point over to your side as well. You have um, the hallway here, and this is considered zone one. So anywhere in zone one um, is like the public, just general access. So this could be the hallway walking by the department or anywhere outside of the, the MR department that's, um, you know, no, no restrictions. And very little to none um, magnetic interaction going on there. Um, next zone is zone two. And this includes like the waiting area and um, any of the areas where they get the patient ready for their exam. We've got over here, we've got your uh, waiting area and your exam area. So, what I would call this area, um, as far as level, would be supervised. So really no one should be in that area unless there's like staff there to keep an eye on. So um, there is a minor amount of magnetic um, activity going on in that area. Um, nothing that you really would have to worry about, say if you have a pacemaker. It's not like it's going to stop your pacemaker there. But um, you know, just be aware that there is the, the residual amount of magnetism going on in there. Um, so so like I said, you have the waiting area, and then here's where they would take the patient back when they would do their screening um, for the exam. So like if they're getting ready to um, do their, uh, you know, they'll change your clothes, they'll check for any magnetic um, items that um, they should have, or if they have any kind of like medical implants that could potentially be um, activated by the um, magnet or have an adverse reaction. This is the point that they, they catch all of that. Next step is um, zone three. And I would call this um, authorized. So really, you have to be an authorized employee or a patient that's being escorted that's already been screened before you want to get into this um, particular area. And so basically what the, that area contains is like a control room that detects work out and then also you'll see in the back, you can see the equipment room that has like the cryogenics and the gradients and other um, equipment that is on um, support the magnet. Um, so yes, yeah, so this one would be an authorized zone. Um, this is about as far as I can give without someone stopping me and asking me or me telling them why, why I'm there. Um, just kind of, you know, it's like the the kind of uh, point of no return as far as safety goes. You don't want anyone just walking in there that's um, unscreened or not authorized to be in there. And then final zone four, which would be the very highest magnetism, this is the actual magnet room itself. At this point, you should only have the patient 
the technicians and by uh, permission, if you're in there and do work, say you have to work on like the vivo um, patient monitor or like the injector in there, you, you need someone I typically have someone in there with me just to make sure that I'm not doing anything stupid or that they know I'm in there because the last thing I want to do is fire things well it's already fired up but you know just to be aware that it's, I'm in there and I'm doing work so that um, there isn't any issues. So this is just explaining the um, different zones. So you have a general public access um, supervised which would be your uh, lobby and waiting area and your um, dressing room. Um, so three restricted would be your control room and your equipment room. And then so four is your actual magnet room. Now, we like I said, every year go over the uh, dangers of the magnetism. You obviously don't want to bring any tools that are made out of a Paris material, uh, ladders, unless they're an MRI rated ladder, et cetera, et cetera. What they don't tell you is that there's a whole bunch of other stuff associated with MRI that can be potentially um, dangerous. Um, again, it probably stuff in the that's not going to really be dealing with, but you may have to go back and work in, in the control room or the equipment room. I know the hospitals I work at a lot of times they'll store their vivos back in the equipment room or their little um, bed wrap um, infusion pumps that they use in there and assorted other things. So you, you may be around some of the stuff. So we'll go over what a gradient is. So basically what a gradient does is um, it you have the main magnetic field in the in the room and in the magnet. Well, what the gradients do is that they're able to take um, the magnet and the strength of it. And they're able to kind of move it around inside the magnet. So when you go into an MRI room and you hear all that banging and clanging and that that noise, that's actually the gradients that's making all that noise. It's not the magnet. So what you'll have. Here's another type of gradient. This is like a thumbprint version. So basically, you have gradients on um, all three planes. So you'll have one on the X plane, you'll have one on the Y plane, and then you'll have one on the Z plane. And so, as to say that they're going to do an exam in the brain, um, they can um, kind of use the magnetic field to pull itself, say, closer to the to the head part or the, where the head's going to be, and that will give them a stronger magnetic field there versus if they were meaning to do, like, say, a core or peripherals, then they can move the magnet strength around. It doesn't move all of it over, but it, it does move a significant amount over to help them um, do their uh, exams. So each one of the planes has its own set of the gradient coil. And um, has a rather high voltage amplifier hooked up to it. So when you walk into the uh, equipment room of an MRI, um, some of them have ind independent gradients, and others have like almost like cabinets where they're all like stacked on top of each other. Um, these guys are like really heavy, and there are several thousand volts of power going through them. So something that Unless you know you have someone there that knows what they're doing, you don't want to mess with. So as as they're using them, they can reach a peak voltage of 2,500 volts. I have a current of 1,000 amps and can reach temperatures of 140 um, degrees Fahrenheit. So just keep in mind that um, that there is high voltage within the magnet room or within the equipment room. So I'll um, just you know, be careful and be aware of that. Cryogens, um, again, something that they really don't talk about much in the, at least the MR training that I've got. So what the cryogens do is basically they cool down the magnet so that it can act as like a superconductor. And typically the cryogen that they use is helium. 
Um, so they'll pump the helium in there, they'll walk into the room, and you'll see like a, you know, like a couple of big tanks, and um, they'll have a little helium placard on them. And then they pump the helium into the, the magnet to help keep it cool. So here's some of the tanks you might see in there. So a lot of times they'll like top the magnet off and they might use like 20% of what they have in the crash and they just keep it there. So, you know, at some point they're going to top it off again. So these are big and heavy and not fun to move around. So when you um, hear the term quench, um, it's pretty significant event for uh, MR. And talking to our MR guys, I you know kind of tried to give a little education as to just exactly what a quench was as opposed to what I thought it was. And so basically, what a quench is is a um, sudden rise in temperature within the magnet um, that will cause the a um, kind of an uncontrolled uh, release of the helium. Um, there's a vent on the top of the magnet room and the magnet that allows the helium then to vent to the outside. Or if you're in that room or if there's a patient in, in the magnet room when this thing quenches, you need to get them out there right away because there is enough potential helium in there that you can suffocate in the room. And most of our rooms are pressurized, so have a pressure vessel. And unfortunately, as the cryogens come in the room, they push against the door, and thus makes it almost impossible for you to get out. So you we might see in a lot of MR rooms is you'll see a brass ball peak hammer hanging next to a window. So what you'll want to do is if you have a quench or an unexpected release of cryogens into the magnet room, you'll want to take that magnet or that hammer and plus the window out. That way, then you can relieve the pressure and then get fresh air to come in there because I guess it takes just a handful of seconds to fill that room up and it um, can be in really bad shape. So, just as a warning, never seen it happen. And to my knowledge, there's never been a death associated to that, but it is a potential hazard or warning that probably most of us aren't aware of. Um, they don't work in the business. Uh, so we'll just go over kind of a basic EMR function. So basically what they use is a magnetic field um, to um, help um, make images. Uh, one advantage of EMR is it doesn't um, expose the patient to large doses of ionizing radiation like a CT scanner. Um, it's also better at giving um, Better resolution on soft tissue and like organs, say like the brain, it's really good, or say like uh, MCL, ACL in your knee, it gives good resolution of the soft ligaments that you wouldn't necessarily see um, in like a traditional imaging modality. Um, works best with um, lots of hydrogen atoms. Basically, what it does is the magnet lines up all of your hydrogen atoms in your cells. It puts them all in a nice straight row. And then um, as the atoms try to realign themselves and the hydrogen gets back into its normal orbit, it will um, leave a signal. And so then what will happen is based on that signal, they're able to determine what they're looking at. So it could be your kidneys, your brain, um, you know, your knees, whatever. And based on that signal response, then they're able then to make an image from your hydrogen atoms realigning back to their original um, orbits. One of the um, basic uh, fundamentals of IMR uh, is what they call time to echo. And so basically it's a RF pulse that um, it leaves like the echo for the machine to um, look at as it's building its uh, image. Then the other um, factor that they use in um, MR is time to repetition. And then that's the actual interval between the time that the hydrogen atoms are lined up and then start to decay back into their original orbits. So here's um, 
Here's an area that probably is a biomed. You're going to be probably called into more likely than you would nuclear medicine or MR. And um, we'll kind of go over some of the, the basics of it and some of the things that you can do um, to protect yourself in these areas. So basically, um, cat lab interventional radiology uses a system what they call is fluoroscopy or a fluoroscopic system. It's basically just a big CR. If you have, you know, been around CRs or the LR, um, normally viewed on a video monitor. So it's like um, instead of like a traditional X-ray, like you go in for a chest X-ray and it takes a shot and you know shows the anatomy. The difference is this is actually real time moving. Um, X rays so that they can use it to help diagnose. Say, when you get a cat lab, you have a blockage in your coronary arteries, they're able to um, put a dye in there, take the images, and then the cardiologist has been able to look at those images and determine as to where the blockage might be. Um, both useful in diagnostic and interventional. Sometimes, a person goes in the cat lab, say they feel their. Um, Stress test and admit they'll send them down to the cat lab, and depending on who's doing the procedure or what level of procedure they do, they might just go in there and take some pictures and say, Oh, okay, we're going to have to move you up to the next level, or they might be, you know, full service and come in and say, You know what, we've got some blockages, we're going to get them out of there and uh, take care of it right here and now. So here's a, a typical um, cat lab. And um, so I'll do both sides. So up here is the digital detector. Um, down here is the uh, x ray tube. So up here is a, the digital detector. And then down here, kind of tucked behind this curtain, is the x ray tube itself. So um, basically, what happens is the patient's on the table. Um, their the x ray beam will be like right behind their back, about uh, like right here. And the x ray actually comes up through the bottom and then um, comes through the table of the patient and then goes up here to this digital detector. Now, the digital detector is kind of like the giant edge sketch. You um, messed with those as a kid. So it's got photodiodes in it, it's got a big, big array in there. What will happen is, is the radiation goes through the front of the detector, which is actually pointing down towards the patient. Um, like the new med camera, um, the radiation then is turned into light. So as the radiation is going through that front part, it then gets converted into light, and then the photodiodes then record each position of each piece of light. So they make, like I said, Kind of like a giant etch sketch. And here's a better view of the um, system itself. So you have the, the digital detector here. You can see the kind of flat area. That's kind of like the etch sketch part of it. And then down here is the actual X ray tube that is pointed up. So as, as the um, um, X ray is being made, it always ends up onto the um, digital detector part. So here we have your x-ray tube. X-ray beam goes through the table of the patient and then goes up to the nose. I'm not expecting that. Surprise. So the x-ray um, goes through here, goes through the table, goes through the patient, and then ends up into on the front of this guy. Scatter. So here's where you're going to probably run into a problem if you get called up. So typical scenario, it's Friday afternoon, it's 3 o'clock, you're getting ready to wrap up for the day, and you get a call from the cat lab, scatter. Our hemodynamics slash monitoring system isn't working. We got a patient on the table. We need you now. So you make your, your way up to the cat and um, walk in there and everyone's standing in the room with their legs on. And you come in and you've got your patient simulator and you're like, yeah, okay. Now what do I do? 
So one thing I'm going to tell you, and it's kind of unfortunate, no one in that room is going to probably care that you're standing there basically naked to the world without any lens on. And especially your cardiologist is not going to care because they don't need the monitoring system to do what they need to do. What they're looking for is blockages. So their first thing is they're going to keep pushing through and they're going to keep making radiation and making images until they get that guy's heart opened up. So that puts you at considerable risk because you're trying to do your job and get the patient monitoring working, but you got the cardiologist in there that's saying, I'm waiting for anyone, I'm going to open up this guy's heart. So those are some considerations that you'll want to keep uh, in mind. Now, chances are you're not going to get um, blasted by the main beam because the main beam is probably going to be up and down, but that seat arm does move. So like this picture here, you can see that um, it's in an oblique position. So that's like an x-ray term. So it means it's at an angle. So you're still not going to get blasted by the main beam because the main beam is coming out this way. But any area around this part here, which probably means where your patient monitoring on uh, your patient interface is going to probably be on the table side. So you're going to be within the, the um, area of where, um, so you got the beam coming this way. And then this general area here is going to be where the scatter is coming from. What scatter is, is any radioactive part of the x ray or beam that doesn't end up into the detector. So what will happen is, as the beam is coming through um, the table and through the patient, parts of the beam is going to start peeling off and going 360 degrees all over the world. Now, the radiation is coming off of it through the scatter is really minor. So, I mean, it's not like you're going to, you know, get cancer with one exposure from it. But our goal is to get zero exposure if at all possible. So, show this side. So, over here will be like your kind of your zone of scatter. And as the beam comes through the table of the patient, then parts of that beam are going to peel off in 360 degrees and become scattered. So again, not, not a high dose of radiation, but it still is radiation. Now here's um, an unlikely scenario, but you may walk into something like this. So right here, the X-ray um, CR is set in the lateral um, position. Now, like in a pipeline room, you'll have a, a setup like this all the time, and then you'll also have your traditional AP um, um, orientation of a pipeline. So basically, a pipeline is two of the same. You would have double the, the X-ray systems in there. Uh, a lot of times, they'll use those in like like a neuron like type room. Where um, they want to get a local lateral and then the traditional view of the brain so that they can actually match up, say, like an aneurysm or maybe an area that's uh, having a stroke, which gives them a better perception of what they're looking at. But so in this case, um, just to make a point, the x ray is going across the room at this point. Now, most of it's going to be absorbed by this digital detector. And you're not going to really have any scatter other than maybe a little bit from the patient, but you know, you still have stuff bouncing around over in this area. So here's the direction of the x-ray beam. So it's actually going across the room. And then you'll have this kind of area here that will um, be your area of scatter that's being emitted as the x-ray is going through. So just I just threw this in just kind of for interest. So this is a, a, a cat lab for an original X-ray tube. So um, so here's the actual X-ray tube itself, and then um, most X-ray most cat labs have some kind of cooling system on them because the tubes get so hot because they use them so much. So this is kind of like the cooling, um, almost like a radiator that the, the water is going through in a water jacket and then goes back out and goes up the sea. 
this big dome looking thing that's the uh, collimator. So I don't know, some, some of the environments I know uh, in places I work at have been trained how to change collimator bulbs um, to help out if you're on a call. Um, this doesn't have a collimator bulb, but this big thing here is, has, has uh, two um, collimators and then it has a spiral collimator. And then it has the, the traditional blades that you might have seen in like a regular um, X-ray system. So here's the collimator. Here's your water jacket that comes in from um, got like a big like dishwasher size cooler at the back or chiller. And then the lights come up, chill the sky, and then go back out um, to the, the chiller. Um, if you get called up and say, you know, you don't have your imaging guy around or whatever, and you see a big puddle down under the x-ray tube, it's probably this guy's from leak or one of the um, hoses is leaking. So best thing you could do is just shut the system down and wait for someone that um, did not look at it beforehand. So, let's see, we see a big puddle of water down here. It's probably this guy leaking and um, Turn the system off because you got a lot of high voltage sitting there. Another type of um, that's real popular now is called a hybrid OR. And where you'll find how hybrid ORs, um, they typically be cardiac cases, but I've not seen them used for like neuro and um, like even interventional. So basically, um, if you're to look at it and break it down, it's no different than that room I just showed you. It's got the um, X-ray tube here on the bottom. And it's got the digital detector up top. So here we got the uh, X-ray tube down here. And then um, the digital detector on here. Now this is a really cool robotic room that I got to work on. So it basically has an industrial robot on the back of the uh, CR. And this thing can do all kinds of things. Um, I could probably, with the fully extended reach over to Dave sitting over there with the C arm from where I'm standing. That's how, how um, mobile and flexible I was. I can also pick up the whole C arm and run it down the entire length of the table or go completely do a 360 around the patient. Um, really super cool. Um, and here, here's an Alaris pump to kind of give you an idea of the scale of how big this thing is. Um, the detector and collimator on the system could also do 360 degrees. So you can do some incredible views that you could do on like the previous systems that um, I showed on there. There's a rotating collimator and then there's a rotating detector. So really super cool. Basically what they do in um, a hybrid OR, there's my my curly little hand next to the main knuckle on it. Give you another uh, reference. And then um, kind of the back view from, from the robot. So this is what I was saying. I could take this arm or take the C arm and actually stick it out in the hallway with the doors open. Um, so yeah, this thing's like super flexible and um, gives you a lot of um, a lot of motion that you wouldn't have from a traditional um, cat lab or IR room. Um, so then like a hybrid room, um, what they have them set up for, so like they'll do like cavers, um, which are like valve replacements. They can do in the heart, they can do them vascularly. They don't have to bust open the um, chest cavity and it's look the patient open. They can actually stick the valves so up through the vascular and only through your leg. And then up into the heart, and then they can then rotor rear out the old valve and then drop the, the new one in its place. So it's pretty, pretty cool stuff. Other things that they'll do in there, they'll do like um, dissected aortas or triple A's, which is where your aorta either is trying to come apart or it has come apart. And what they want to do is have the ability to turn it into like a CBOR. So that if they can't fix you through the vascular system, then what they'll do then is they'll set it up as like your typical um, cardiac OR, and then they'll split you open, and then they'll they'll do it the old-fashioned way. 
So everything in the room is set and ready to go. So if the doc says, hey, you know what, we're losing this guy, we need to open him up, that everything's right there, as opposed to like a cat lab, you have to load him up and then take him to the OR, which would cause additional delay in time. So that's kind of the advantages of um, having a hybrid OR as opposed to just a traditional cat lab or OR. Um, one device that you'll probably run into if you work in the OR, you'll see them around with your CR. And um, most of the CRs are portable, so you'll see a roll on the back and forth and stuff. Basically, just a miniature version of a, of a cat lab or a IR. And um, just from personal experience, um, they normally use them in orthopedic type cases. And I will tell you that the orthopedic surgeon is going to be just like the cardiologist. They're not going to care if you come in there and you don't have your legs on. So, um, so here's the, the CR. Like I said, you'll see them parked in the hallways, and um, they're just a smaller version. And they have the same setup, so they have the X ray tube on the bottom. And then, this case that has an image intensifier, does the same thing as a digital detector. Um, just records an image, turns it to light, and then there's like a camera up here on the top of the um, image intensifier that records it, makes a video image, and then sends it back to um, there's like a card that um, it's connected to. So basically, you know, they're probably saying, okay, great, so I could call it to the cat lab or my R or the hybrid OR, or I could call it to the OR, and they're using one of these guys. What do I do? So what I had to do in the past, since I was the cat lab guy, um, and I get called up there frequently, I went to the manager and I said, you know, this really is a cool that I'm getting just blasted every time I come in to fix your equipment for you. So I worked with the, the manager and he, and he bought me my own set of legs. Everyone knew that those belonged to BioMed and BioMed knew where they were at. So that they had to run in, take the time, Put on your on your legs as you're putting on your bouffant and bunny suit and all that other stuff that you got to put on, and that way you're 100 sure that you're going to be protected and that you don't have to feel um, exposed to, to the radiation. So it really, it's upon um, you to take the time to protect yourself because, like I said, no one in that room, the cardiologist or the orthopedic surgeon. The staff's already frantically running around. This guy's come in, he's had a heart attack, and they're trying to save this guy. So they're focused on their stuff. Not that they're bad people, but just, you know, want to get their job done too. So really take the time. If you don't feel safe, um, I would raise my hand and say, hey, I need, I need to talk to someone. And then maybe they can then help you get protected so that you're not getting needlessly exposed to radiation. So one thing to remember with um, radiation, um, in this case it's ionizing radiation as opposed to like nuclear medicine, it's um, source radiation. Source radiation never shuts off. It's always on until that isotope breaks down to its half-life. In the case of like this, you're looking more at like ionizing radiation, like so you would with the CR, traditional X-ray room. So, oops. So your first protection is time. So the least time that you're actually in the room or around the radiation, the least less your exposure will be. Um, next one will be your distance. Now, the old timers taught me that you should be pretty safe, like, like with the COVID, you want to stay about six feet away from the X-ray tube. You might get a little exposure, but it, it's a pretty safe gauge as to far how far back. Now, I wouldn't take that as a gospel, and I wouldn't use that as your safety standard, but just in your mind that if you're six feet away from um, the uh, X-ray, um, you're probably going to be okay. Now, scat you to go across the whole room, so that's not 100% accurate, but at least you're not going to get blasted by the, by the system if you're that far away. Um, next area is your shielding. So, you know, when you walk in there, you know, say the traditional x ray room, you got the 
will we'll come you there where the technologist stands and they you know, lean over and say, hey, hold your breath. If you stay back behind them, you're going to be 100 percent safe. You're not going to have any kind of disclosure at all. Um, your biggest area that you're going to be potentially exposed is if um, you walk into an interventional kind of procedure and you've got like a CR and there's like no place to stand behind. They do make plexiglass shields. So, like, say, if the anesthesiologist is in there, they'll put the plexiglass between them and the x ray beam, but they, you'll still see them burn their legs. So, it's just so they don't get extra radiation that um, they don't really need. Um, and then, of course, then you have your traditional lead apron um, that will, for the most part, give a pretty good um, protection. Um, I mean, I'll have my dosimeter when I'm in there. And, Rarely, rarely ever get any kind of significant amount of um, exposure um, with the lead on um, wearing it. So, and on that, thank you for your time and coming in in the morning. Um, any questions or comments?